Hello, and thank you for joining us here for Cherry Blossom Home Edition. The Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival takes place every year, the last weekend of April, here in Marshfield, Missouri. And it's our mission to preserve American history and to present it in a unique and interesting way. This year, due to the pandemic, we have moved our festival online and hope that you will enjoy the interviews and panels that we have in store for you. Hi, I'm Joe Yankovetic. And uh, this time I'm involved because I'm a fine artist doing paintings. And uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work in Atlanta with the Marietta Gone with the Wind Museum. And that's where I met lovely Carolyn Grimes. And we immediately hit it off and we talked about creating some artwork based on It's a Wonderful Life. And we've become friends ever since. Um, and through that, we also ended up working in Marshfield for the Cherry Blossom Festival. She had already been here when I was invited. And uh, so we always look forward to getting to see each other again when we get to Marshfield. Now, uh, last year when I attended was the first time I got to meet Janine Roos. And that was a joy and a real, such a pleasure to get to meet this wonderful lady. Um, so Carolyn, say hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, as you know, was Zuzu in It's a Wonderful Life. And Janine, say hi. Hi, and I like all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> she Including played. Including you, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Janine was young Violet in It's a Wonderful Life. So, um, Janine, let's start with, with you. Um, I understand. How, what, what films were you involved with as a child? That was the only film I was involved with. I was primarily on the radio. It was the golden age of radio at that time. And uh, I played Phil Harris and Alice Faye's older daughter, uh, baby Alice. So that, that was my primary. What uh, kind of a character was that? She was a sweet little girl. She was like Alice Faye. Oh, okay. I had a sister named Phyllis, uh, who was like Phil. <laughs> <laughs> she followed in his footsteps. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. So I, w I was a very sweet little girl. <laughs> and, you, and you started quite young. I was giggling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Carolyn. You started at, what, the age of four? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did that come to be? Oh, my mother lived in California. She knew an agent. She took me to see the agent, and boom, boom. You know, that's all it took. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, a lot of the kids that lived in Hollywood, they all worked in the movies. It wasn't a big deal because most everyone in the industry was in the industry there in one way or the other, living in Hollywood. So it was just something that most all of the kids did. It wasn't a big deal at all. Janine? Yes? Uh, how, how did it start with you? Uh, I was six, seven years old, mm -hmm. and there was an uh, audition to play Phil Harris's daughter on the Jack Benny show. So I went for the audition. My mother would sit around with all the other mothers and talk about auditions and things to get their children involved in. And I went and auditioned and got the part. So that was the beginning. Okay. Um, so when, how long did your career last then in, in uh, performing? I performed until I was 17 when I started university. Okay. And I knew at that point that I did not want the life of a performer. Uh, so I made the decision to move into a different field. And you also grew up in California, right? Oh yes, I was born, I was born a mile and a half from where I live now. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> moved very far. <laughs> uh, Carolyn. Uh, your your life took a twist, and you left around the same time, didn't you? Like when you were in high school, just were you in high school when you left the yeah, industry? I was, 
15. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, so and did, you went to college, right? You went to uh, in Missouri? Yes, I went to college in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And what was your major there? Music. Oh, really? <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? I did not know that. Oh. I was a singer and I also um, got a scholarship for violin. Oh my. That's what paid my way. Okay. Classical? Yes. Oh. Yes, now, I, cause you changed careers then though, right? Or did you, well, yes. did you start off as a music person when you graduated? No, I didn't graduate. Okay. I decided to change horses in the middle of the stream. Mm -hmm. I knew that music wasn't going to pay my way. So I changed and became a laboratory technician. So I went to school for that. Okay. And so I became a med tech. Gotcha. Big change. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I got to work with a lot of great people. You mean as a technician? Yes, yes. I worked in a doctor's office clinic and I had my regular patients and the doctor that I worked for for 15, 20 years, he uh, was the... <sighs> And he was worked for the German embassy. So all the people that were suing Germany for money from being in prison camps mm -hmm. came to him for their physicals. And they had to go through that office to do that. So I saw so many survivors from prison camps and the, the terrible days of World War II. They all had numbers on their arms. It was a very interesting career and I was lucky to get a job with this firm that was you know involved in helping these people. Wow that's tremendous. Uh, Janine. Yes. You uh, went into the university with a whole new life ready. What, what prompted you and, or, and where, did, where did you end up? You froze. I'm sorry. What uh, what you said you decided you weren't going to make a career as a performer. What, right. what did you choose? Well, I first chose nursing. I wanted to be of service to people who needed help. Uh, I eventually became a clinical psychologist, and that's how I work at the present time. So. And as a psychologist, did you ever share with anybody of uh, your experience with It's a Wonderful Life? No, no. It's about them, it's not about me. Right, okay. Um, when did the film kind of come back and get you? Actually, it was uh, thanks to Nicholas Inman from the Cherry Blossom Festival. He called me um, and invited me to attend I think it was in 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, I had up till then just rejected any possible offers that were made. Uh, but there was something in his tone, his voice, that I, I didn't say no immediately. Mm -hmm. And eventually I said yes. And it was a turning point in my, in my life vis-a-vis -vis It's a Wonderful Life. Now, had you been in contact with Carolyn at all during that time? No, no, we'd never met. Wow. We first met at the Cherry Blossom Festival. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn, mm -hmm. how did, how did uh, or when did you start working with the Cherry Blossom Festival? Oh. And, and what persuaded maybe, you to come? I don't know, maybe the second year they had it, or third, uh-huh. Um, they invited me and they showed um, Rio Grande. Uh-huh. And it was supposed to be, well, back then the festival was a different time. It was a little later. And, and so, um, no, it was earlier. That was earlier. That's what it was. And it rained, it snowed, it sleeted. 
It did everything nasty they could possibly do. So no one showed up to anything. <laughs> it was very, very, very low attendance. But uh, I had a wonderful time, and um, I love the local people so much. And we started becoming friends. And so it's been a long time. And now I have many friends there in Missouri. And I love the people. Uh, I feel like they're part of my family. It's, it's just a wonderful experience to enjoy the camaraderie that happens at the Cherry Blossom Festival every year. It's a great opportunity to learn and also to learn to love, I think. Yes, Morgan and I were discussing that. Morgan Brittany, I talked to her yesterday and we have oh. the same comment. Uh, her interview is going to totally be uh, shown on Saturday. I'm sorry? I totally agree with what yeah. Carolyn said. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, I want to get back. Um, so you had left California, you went to Missouri, got, had a whole new career, married with kids. What brought It's a Wonderful Life back into your life? In 1980, somebody knocked on my door and they said, uh, were you the little girl that played Zuzu in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? And I said, well, yes. And they said, well, can we have an interview? And I said, oh, sure. So I brought them in the house and I drug all my stuff up from the basement and I showed them this stuff and didn't think too much about it. And the next week it happened again. And I was quite surprised because I haven't really told anybody. And so then it started appearing in local papers and all around and I got more requests for interviews and things just started popping. And, and I thought, wow, I guess I better sit down and watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I was 40 years old before I saw the film. Okay. And when I saw the film, I knew the magic was there. I knew how it talked to people and what a great influence it could have on anybody that watched it. And it certainly had a great influence on me. So I've been a champion for It's a Wonderful Life ever since. I mean, it touches people like nothing else I've ever seen. Changes lives, gives people hope. It's, it's a wonderful entity for well, about- Well, if you remember when positive. we met, when we met in Atlanta, yeah, we were, we were sitting in the bar uh, where we had our meeting, and the bartender was telling us that her mother watched the film every week. Yes, every that's week. right. Every week, yeah. she just it just <laughs> rejuvenated her and gave her like a a sense of stability, if you would. Mm -hmm. I think so. that during this time of sheltering in place, it it is a comfort for many people watching the movie. I how old were you, Janine, how old were you when you saw the film for the first time? Oh, I, I was in my 20s. So I, I was fairly young. I, I was just, but I, I didn't watch it every year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how did it affect you when you saw it? Or did mm. it? It didn't really affect me at that moment. I think I, w I was uh, somewhat dissociated from the, from the film at that point. Mm -hmm. um, the times were different then too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The state of the world and the way people were, it was different. I think if I'd have seen it when I was 20, I think I would have felt the same way. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh -huh. well, I tried to remember was, uh, when, when I saw the movie. I remember seeing the uh, Marlo Thomas version on television in the late 70s. I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, but I don't know if I had seen the original prior to that. I think when we watched it, my mom made the comment, oh, this is a remake of, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. But that was way before they started airing it a lot. And I remember when it was on television over and over again, that's when I finally got to sit and watch it a few times. And, th and that was in the 80s. Yes. Yeah. 
when it was no longer under uh, any, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, rights, the rights were released rights, and it yeah. was in public domain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody could show it back then. Right. So, um, Carolyn, tell us a little bit about how you've used the film in your speaking. Uh, I know that's how you met your husband, Chris, was uh, talking uh, and using the, the film as part of your tool. Actually, I met him for a different reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You got to get this right. Yes. <laughs> you know, I lost a son to suicide. Right. And um, Chris is a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. And he was attending a, uh, an annual meeting of the American Association of Suicide Prevention. Or, and I was asked to be uh, the guest speaker for the dinner. Right. And I, it, I'd never talked about my personal life in public ever, ever. And I was a freaking mess. <laughs> I was just so nervous. And, and I did the speech. I did it. And I talked about, you know, trying to give people advice as to how to handle situations or handle people who have gone through the same thing I was going through. And, um, I don't know. I just, I was very, very nervous and upset. So afterwards, um, he was the last one to come through the line for an autograph. And so the whole speech was really about suicide and right. the prevention of and how to get through it and things like that. But wasn't so, It's a Wonderful Life part of that? They ha took the movie and dissected the movie. Right. Okay. In regards to suicide. Right. So I wasn't Florida. wrong. I just... I was saying, no, no, how no, did you no, use it as no. a tool? Yes, yes. But I didn't talk about the film. I mean, that right. was not why I was there. Right. I was there to just share my own personal experiences and and to maybe encourage other people to survive, um, to just get through it and yes. so forth. So that's how I met him. And, and we just couldn't stop talking. <laughs> we just talked and talked and talked. And so that that's what started it. Uh -huh. By the end of the year, we were together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh janine how have you been able to use this i mean after since you've been involved with the cherry blossom festival and you've come out as a it's a wonderful life actress I've come out of the closet <laughs> yes <It> sure has <laughs> how, how has this how have you been able to use this well i i use the message of it uh that that the individual by in and by themselves need others to to live a full rich life um, mm -hmm. and I use the message with my patients uh, so it it's one that's very powerful particularly when people are feeling very depressed and lonely and unnecessary mm -hmm. yeah now, you are both on the board for Zuzu's House. Is that correct? Yes. Carolyn's the yes. chair, chairman? No, no. I'm in the sort of the advisory board. Okay. Neen is the one who is in the trenches. Gotcha. Well, I was in the trenches until the end of the last year. I'm now on the advisory board. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I was and, actively involved in the planning for a year and a half. Oh, so you were involved in planning the house? Yes. Okay. I was, I was consulting with them regarding the mental health aspects of the okay. program. How did this come to be? How did the house even happen? Can either of you answer I think it was that? Nicholas. Well, I, it, Nicholas called me in December that year, I don't remember what it was, two years ago, do you think? 2018. Okay, he called me and he said, I just found out there were 28 high school kids that were couch surfing. I didn't even know what couch surfing meant, he said. 
And he said, I found out, he said, these people, these kids don't have a place. They don't have a home. And he said, we've got to fix that. So he said, I'm going to see if we can start a house. And he said, I want to ask your permission. And if you'd be a part of it, and we're going to call it the Zuzu house. And so I was thrilled to death that they would do that. And I just encouraged him wholeheartedly to really get started and and man he when he gets his mind set to do something look out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so and that was about the same time that uh janine you came aboard uh, with the cherry blossom festival so that yes it was shortly after that yeah mm -hmm. so what a wonderful situation to be in where this is coming about and you're the professional to help make it the right place what, what did you have to uh, consider? What did you have to do for this? Well, when I was at the Cherry Blossom Festival, I would meet with the various individuals in the high schools and talk to them about what they needed, what, what the students needed, what they saw as the problems. Uh, and we talked about possible solutions and how the house could be a facilitator of that. So, it so, was very interesting. So what I, does the house I, actually do? What's the uh, mission of the house? Well, the mission is to provide resources and, and re a residence for individuals who are homeless, who are teenagers. What, that are teenagers? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. Now, is it just for, for females or? male and female well originally it was to be male and female what happened was they purchased a house in town and the house had five bedrooms and the city would only allow them to have one person per bedroom and, and the fifth bedroom had to be used for a person who was on residence uh 24 hours mm -hmm. so so they felt that serving four people was not going to be sufficient. And they sold that house and bought another uh, building outside of the town where there were fewer restrictions. And that, that will have many more beds, many more um, beds for pe the children. So. When does that open? Do you know? I don't know. Carolyn, do you have anything? Well, it's on stand still right now. I mean, you know, there's not a lot I think they oh, yeah. can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they have to do construction. Yes. Uh -huh. The the building was an old church and it's quite quite large. Isn't it, Janine? I'm as I yeah, it's quite large. So but it also uh, had termites. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of termite damage <laughs> so they had to repair that and uh it, i think it, it has two kitchens mm -hmm. so you know it's um once they get it renovated and get it started it'll be a great facility the also in addition to the residents we were talking about having a program for teenagers in general in the community that would serve their needs for uh, learning how to live life, you know, basic now, these, life skills. Are these teenagers who are still in high school? Yes, still in high school and still living at home. Oh, okay. And but now the, the children or the teens that are will be in residence here. Will they also be in high school as well? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So they will be going to school and then this is the home that they come back to after school. Right. Uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. So what kind of situations uh, would allow that, that team to find a home here? Uh, it can't be just, oh, I don't want to live at my, with my parents anymore. I, I, well, I, I think the high school counselors are pivotal in, in 
referring them to the program. Okay. Yeah, Which is a, why we were why we were collaborating with them to mm -hmm. set up the program. Yeah, I had a coworker that came home from school one day and his parents, his mother and his stepfather had moved. Huh? <laughs> and didn't tell him. They took their new child and they left him. And he was couch surfing for a while. Oh my. And then he became a theater major so he could, and he lived in the theater without anybody knowing it. Because mm. he could shower there and, and yet uh, getting work at like 15. So, but I understand the plight of, of a teen having to go through stuff. So what, what kind of a facility are they looking to have? What kind of services will the child be able to uh, acquire there? Will they have any learning skills or preparing them for the world? Uh, aside from if they're going to high school for education, what, what will they be getting? Well, those life skills, but they'll also have access to medical care, uh, referrals for any mental health services that are needed. Um, learn how to get a job, learn how to be responsible for themselves. You know, important life lessons. But they'll also have meals and um, clothing. Do they, so that they would be, um, would they be learning uh, work skills then as well or? That would be a, the high school. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I worked a lot with McLaren Hall in California and it was a foster care. Mm -hmm. You probably are familiar with it. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing what they were providing for the kids, at least when I was there. Um, what else? Carol, do you have anything to add about the, the house or? No, I'm just, I'm just so excited to see it um, come together in this new facility and it's it's going to be quite a thrill. Now what can our viewers do to participate or to help make this what it needs to be? Well I'm sure that Nicholas would not turn away a donation okay. of any kind. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that would be very welcome. Um, mm -hmm. We've had some fundraisers and we'll continue to do so but there's always the need for funding and it would be a great help if people could just, you know, give a few dollars to, to help these kids so they'd have some kind of a foundation and to help them get started in life. Because mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be with, without parents and to be kind of on the fly. I know what that's like. So, you know, it's pretty scary and I'm sure now it's even worse with all the the other things in the world that are there, drugs and so forth going on. So it's hard. Yeah. These kids, but that would be my thinking. I would just okay. add that people who live in the area of Marshfield uh, could talk to Nicholas about volunteering time to the facility. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great, yes. <laughs> So I want you to show that picture that you painted. Oh, <laughs> this is uh, Zuzu's prize. Oh, <laughs> Joe <laughs> painted that and it has a, a little, I have a, a rose in my, my, I'm walking home from school with my rose in my hand <laughs> and I have a guardian angel over me, looking uh, over me. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. in, in the corner, painted. up in here there's a, you can see Jimmy Stewart's face. Oh, it's hidden, but you can see it. You see it. That's so, so lovely. And Joe the, puts uh, a lot of 
hidden things in his pictures. And it was, I just love that picture. I think it's beautiful. Thank you. That, and uh, I think the, the dress and the coat were actually from the bishop's wife. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then, of course, after it was finished, then I saw pictures of your coat that uh, from some of the stills from It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> it would have been a little bit more appropriate, but <laughs> it's worked out fine. <laughs> I'll have to do another one. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the recent one that I don't, I should get, get it up there. There's another one that I did. Where is it? To commemorate the, uh, the last major anniversary of It's a Wonderful Life. And in it, um, I have hidden in the adults because it's the last scene. Let me, uh, let me grab that. Hold on a minute. Keep talking. We aren't going anywhere. <laughs> I wasn't planning on pulling this out. So, Janine, is Joe surviving the lockdown? Joe is Janine's yes. son. Yes, he, he's giving a lot of loving care to his house. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then yeah. won't it come out ahead? <laughs> He, I get to see him and talk to him six feet away. <laughs> oh my goodness. What's that? We were talking about her son. Oh. He's also named Joe. <laughs> That's yes. I heard that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Really? Yeah. <laughs> He's 21 years old. 21? 21. Yes. yes. And so this is his time to wind down before he goes to bed. Otherwise, he gets a little agitated. Uh, so this is the picture that I did um, to commemorate the anniversary. And hidden in the elbow of Jimmy Stewart is young George Bailey. And in Mary Bailey's hair is young Mary Bailey, and in Violet's fur is young Violet. Hmm. Huh. The king of hidden things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, they didn't fit, you know, just doing them naturally with everybody else in the cast. I mean, I did sneak in um, Clarence and even Mr. Uh, oh, Lionel Barrymore is in it. I put it, just about everybody that I could in the film into the picture. Hmm. So, <laughs> so even though they're all not there in the actual film at that time, I wanted to capture all of that. And even um, uh, Peter Bailey, the, the grandfather or the father of George Bailey, he's actually in, in the background in a photo uh, hanging on the wall. How long does it take you to do something like that? Until I finish it. <laughs> this, this one I probably spent as much time trying to arrange all the faces because I arranged it all on the computer so I oh. could move them around and fit them and all so I spent probably as much time getting all the pictures and arranging them as I did painting it interesting wow. hmm. the prep time is the hardest I admire your creativity. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so um, I don't know what else we can talk about. We're, <laughs> we're only at a half hour here. Um, <clears throat> we're only a half an hour? Yeah. Isn't it? It's 8 o'clock, my time. We started yeah, at you're right. 7.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Carolyn, you were sharing, and I don't know how many people would know about this, but you had a Zuzu doll that you sold, right? Um, sold. Uh, oh, sold. sold. Oh, okay. Yes. Did you have a line of them? I did. Yes, and you were telling me about a woman that you gave a doll to. You want to tell me yes. that story? 
Well, I don't know which one it is, but this is the one I'll wing it with. Okay. I was invited. That was the same time that I met Chris. Right. That's the story. At yeah. the convention. Yes. And um, the lady, uh, I had arranged with a lady from West Memphis, who, which is kind of a sort of area that um, maybe the kids need a little help. And um, it's not a real rich area. So um, she arranged for me to go to, I told her I wanted to do something. So she said she would arrange something. So she put me up in the library and um, I asked Chris if he wanted to go with me, even though I just met him. <laughs> and he said, sure. So, so he went with me and he, just as we were leaving, he says, why don't you take one of your dolls? And I said, oh, okay. So he said, I just feel like you should. So he took the doll and we took it with us and um, we did the, the event at the library, met a lot of people. There was a couple of ladies that brought their little girls in dressed like Zuzu and they had roses and it was just wonderful. And it was the first time Chris had really ever seen anything like that because he'd never seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> Can't imagine I had anything to do with him. <laughs> <laughs> but he um he he brought the doll and this gal that brought me in her name was alice tillotson and she was just the sweetest soul and she said you know i have a friend who also lost a daughter and she did a suicide and um, it was a very unpleasant one and she had not gotten back into her life. She was unable to seem to do it. So she said, I've invited her to come tonight because she hadn't been out at all. And so I said, well, sure, that'd be fine. So Chris and I talked and we decided we would give her the doll. So we kept the doll and we would give it to her if she showed up. Well, she showed up and we, we talked and we, and we had sort of an epiphany. It was like, she opened up about how she missed her daughter so much, but her daughter had appeared to her and told her, I want you to let me go. And so I had just got through telling her those very words. I said, you must let her go, let her go on and live her life wherever she is. She's somewhere and you're, your spirit, your emotions are trying to hold her here in on this earth and she doesn't want to be here. So she said, I thoroughly understand that. And she saw angels and I believe in angels and I believe you can see angels and I believe you can feel the spirit of angels. You can feel them. And she felt that and she cried and it was quite uh, a moment. And, um, so I gave her the doll and she was thrilled to death and it meant a lot to her. And it was just one of those things that the, the doll represented love and perhaps the feeling of something good in her life. And it turns out she collected dolls. So <laughs> it was a great thing to do. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's, that's what we did with the doll. They are no longer being made, but um, now I have bells. There you go. <laughs> and we ring bells to give angels their wings. Right. <laughs> and I read that you rang a bell in another film, too. I did. A John Wayne movie, Rio Grande. I was the school teacher's daughter. And I ran up and down the hill with a bell in my hand at the very beginning of the movie. And I rang a bell uh, all during that film. I had that dumb bell in my hands throughout the whole film. It was crazy. And then at the end, I'm standing uh, in a mission on this uh, kind of a platform. And I'm ringing the mission bell to bring the Calvary in. And I'm ringing that bell and ringing that bell. So, yeah, bells mean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> They've meant a lot to me in my life. <laughs> uh. 
Um, Janine, do you have any stories that you can share about uh, uh, working with people? At, I mean, you've, you've been dealing with uh, people for you know, years. This has been your career as a psychologist. And you said that you've used the message of the story to help people. And do you have any stories that you want to share with us? Um, I'm sorry, but none can really come to mind at okay. this moment. Um, during this COVID sheltering in place, it, it has been an underlying theme with many people because of the feeling of isolation. Some people feel like it's house arrest and punishment. Other people feel like it's, it's a good thing and a protected, protection, uh, but they miss the, the larger uh, community. Zoom gives them some of that, but not, not really. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a substitute. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Well, as a, as a professional, how would you counsel somebody during this time? What, what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, as a professional, I don't give them advice. I help okay. them, <laughs> I, I help them figure out <laughs> okay. what, what works for them. Um, but but I, I help them. Often, they're, they're out of contact with how they're feeling. I can, I can hear how they're feeling and see how they're feeling, but they're not fully aware of it. So I'm like a mirror. Uh, reflecting to them uh, the ways that I hear them and and it helps them ground themselves in in, in everyday life um, I'm thinking about one person was complaining about feeling very constricted and I said well how often do you go out for a walk and he said I haven't been going out for a walk and I said well if I had to prescribe something for you, I would say, go out for a walk twice a day. <laughs> and so when I spoke. Oh, we're frozen here. Spirits were much happier. So. Can you repeat that? You froze on us. Pardon? Can you repeat some of that? The last part of it, because you froze on us. Oh, that uh, he he told me today that he had been going for a walk twice a day since our last session and that it had remarkably improved his spirits. Oh, so he was great. able to tolerate the sequestering much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, we're all in different states. So, oh no, you're, you're in California now, right, Carolyn? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I yeah, am now. Yeah. So, but is it handled a little, little differently in uh, Northern California than it is in, but you're in LA. No, yeah. it's just about the same. We're um, wearing face masks if we go oh. out and um, we like go to the grocery store maybe once a week. And that's, it's, the, we're, we're doing it the same. Yeah. Okay. It's a statewide order. Right. Mm -hmm. Chris is working. Chris is working. Oh, good. He's not a non-essential. <laughs> no, he's an essential. Yes. Oh, Janine, I, I, ha I should tell you about what he's doing. It's really great. Is he going to the office? Yes, he is. But he's working. He has a different job now. He's ah. working for the Quartz Indian Reservation. Oh. And he's working in the, in the uh, health clinic. And um, it's new, and he's studying all about the Karuk Indian. And it's, he's Ooh. loving it. He really loves it. Interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys can talk a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've enjoyed Janine so much since she decided to be a part of our lives. And That's we've great. become very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's like um, family in a way because Joe always her son comes with her 
Well, not always, but most of the time. So we know him too. And it's just been a wonderful time when we get together. It is. I hope we are able to this year. In oh, I do too. Uh, <laughs> we were able to so spend time with, uh, with Janie, with Carol, Carol Coombs uh, Mueller, mm -hmm. uh, when she came to visit her son out here. He's, he's only about an hour away from us. Craig. Oh. Yeah. So that Craig was Mueller. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, nice. he used to live with me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we had Joseph, a really nice day with them out there. Joseph, have you ever been to the Seneca Falls Festival? Yes, I you have. have. Oh. Yeah, I keep trying to get back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you make it. Yes. <laughs> well, we're talking about this coming year, but definitely the following year is the anniversary, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, this year is a little bit up in the air about everything, actually. Right. We'll have to see. Yeah. I have a painting um, sketched out of uh, young Mary Bailey and young Violet with young George hmm. at the soda fountain. That It'll be I'm, good. I'm looking to do it as a very kind of Rockwell-ish kind of a thing. Oh. So, well, I'll look forward to seeing it. Yeah. I've had it uh, sketched out for a couple of years now. <laughs> 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 so, By so the we'll time see. you finish it, young Violet and young Mary Bailey will be elderly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the joy of the painting. <laughs> Unlike Dorian Gray. <laughs> Okay. Well, Are we close? This has been very nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, I, miss, I miss the festival terribly. Yeah. I, I think that it's a, a special part of my life every year. And um, I've made so many friends that I miss them. And I look forward to next year. Got to be back at the yeah. end. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Well, I hope that everyone can endure what this lockdown is, is, is doing to us. But there are a lot of lessons to learn from this, I think. And um, one of them is perhaps maybe an appreciation for the lives we have and the, how we, we have so many freedoms and we have so many opportunities. And I think we take it for granted sometimes. And now that things have changed, perhaps when we come out of this, we might change too in a good way. Oh, well, that's a good thought. Yes. I, well, I've, I've been struck by how blue the sky is and how you can hear the birds chirping uh, and animals are re relocating into their natural space. Uh, and, and I think it's a lesson that we need to take seriously, that there's a way in which we need to find a different way of harmonizing with nature. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, where we are, we have a lot of red head uh, cranes. Oh. Uh, there's sandhill cranes that we have, and uh, just a variety of different birds that are large birds. And uh, every day they come by our yard and they, they uh, eat out of the bird feeder and visit and uh, they've learned to just uh, watch us and they don't panic and run away. You know, we can sit mm. and talk to them. And it's, they're very regal, so. But yes, exactly. I have birds of deer. Mm-hmm. They're in my backyard all the time. Oh. They eat the grass. You can't have flowers. <laughs> <laughs> They're sweet and beautiful, but boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you ladies so much for sharing. Um, I'm hoping that this will be a really good boost for the Zuzu house and people will sit and watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life again and yeah. realize that it is I a wonderful life. 
I hope so. <laughs> Thank you for Thank letting us be a part of this. And we missed the Cherry Blossom Festival, but this is, this is okay. Yeah. Yes, this is a, a nice second best. <laughs> <laughs> And think about how many people will be able to enjoy this that would not have been at the festival. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's true. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you Bye. so much again, Carolyn Grimes and Janine Roos. And this is Joe Yakovetic. And uh, we're wishing you a wonderful life. In closing, we'd like to thank all of you again for watching. And we'd like to encourage you to stay connected to the Cherry Blossom Festival through our Facebook page and website. Our Facebook page is Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival in Marshfield, Mo, and our website is cherryblossomfest.com. There you'll find more panels and interviews and pictures representing the best of American history. And we hope to see all of you here in Marshfield next year as we celebrate the 15th Cherry Blossom Festival.